If you give a little more than you take And if you try to fix more than you break If you're the kind who takes the time to help a stranger in the rain There's a place for people like you if you stand up for those down on their knees And lend a voice to those who cannot speak If you shine a little light, give sight to the ones who've lost their way There's a place for people like you I've heard up there the streets are made of gold And when you get there, there's a hand to hold I believe when your day's down here or through There's a place up there for people like you if you walk around with your heart on your sleeve And if you're trying to be the change you want to see If you lay down your life for love so someone could be saved There's a place for people like you Streets are made of gold And when you get there There's a hand to hold I believe When your day's down here or through There's a place Up there For people like you
made of gold And when you get there There's a hand to hold There's a place up there for people like you I know you're out there, so keep doing what you do Cause there's a place up there for people like you If you give a little more than you take And if you try to fix more than you break If you're the kind who takes the time to help a stranger in the rain There's a place for people like you if you stand up for those down on their knees And lend a voice to those who cannot speak If you shine a little light, give sight to the ones who've lost their way There's a place for people like you I've heard up there the streets are made of gold And when you get there, there's a hand to hold I believe when your day's down here or through There's a place up there for people like you if you walk around with your heart on your sleeve And if you're trying to be the change you want to see If you lay down your life for love so someone could be saved There's a place for people like you are made of gold And when you get there There's a hand to hold I believe When your day's down here or through There's a place Up there For people like you Good morning, everyone. I stand before you this morning as a member of Willis Poppy Small to say thank you to each and every one of you for your outpouring of love, support, praise over the last couple of weeks. And as we come this morning to celebrate the life of our dear cousin, brother, uncle, son, I just want to encourage you guys that we trust that what is being done here today, that when you all leave, you will leave with an uplifting spirit because we're not only here, we're not here to mourn, but to give God thanks for the life that Willis has lived over the years. And so this morning is only fitting that we begin with some tributes from close colleagues, family members, and friends who are here to share 
some of those fond memories of Willis. And we would like to start this morning with the first tribute from none other than Dwight Sutherland, the Honorable Dwight Sutherland, MP. Let us, Mr. Sutherland, can you please come and join us? Good morning to those who have gathered here so far. To celebrate the life of Willis Poppy Small. You know, some three years ago I stood here when asked by Herma and Poppy to eulogize their son, not knowing that I would be here three years later to pay a tribute to my very, very, very good friend. In preparing for this tribute, I spent time reflecting on my friendship with Mr. Small. And my mind was drawn to a truism. It has been said that friendship isn't about who you have known the longest but who walked into your life and said, I'm here for you, and proved it. I start there. I was introduced to Willis Poppy Small, and forgive me if I just stare at Poppy. I was introduced to Willis Poppy Small by his son, the late Carlos. Some of you know him as Biglos Small who referred to me as his big brother. My relationship with Carlos started back in the 1980s at the law school. And when I met Poppy, Carlos took me to meet his father. He said, my dad is a large boy, Dwight, you need to meet him. And from that first day I met Poppy, I felt as though I was his second an older son. I later met, I knew Hilford for years, and we have a lot in common, large boys as well, and we shared a lot. He would always reference Hilford. But our relationship grew from strength to strength. From my, my evening visits to the pharmacy to see Carlos and Poppy, to regular and very long visits at his home in Marchfield, I call it Marchfield. Some say six rows, but it's Marchfield, right, Herman? Marchfield in St. Philip. Many nights, we dropped to sleep talking. Poppy in one couch, and I in another. Sometimes I had to wake him up and ask him to close the house and open the gate to let me leave to go home. Some mornings, two and three o'clock, I'm now leaving. My wife was very curious about what attracted me to St. Philip. <laughs> but as any good husband would do, I took her to Marchfield, and she too became a friend of Mr. Small. Poppy's home became my second home, and he regularly uttered the phrase, this is your place of solace after your busy days and demanding schedule, feel free to come anytime. In addition to him being a father figure, he was also a confidant to me. I could share my thoughts freely and certainly benefited from the wisdom and life experiences he shared with me. He was a true friend of mine. You could not want a more humble and sincere person than Poppy Small. To the point that he often uttered how some persons took advantage of his kindness. I said that boldly because he's my friend. This kindness, though, was also surpassed by an even greater virtue. The virtue of humility. Despite all that he had achieved as a successful businessman, 
Unlike the name, Mr. Small was big in humility and remained a humble man until his death. Because of my frequent visits to his home, Poppy's family became my family, and Poppy's friends became my friends. I recall vividly having a drink with Poppy and Dr. David Eswick while he took stock. We were busy chatting away, and he was calmly taking stock, interjecting and referring to the two of us as needed. I recall as well inviting in Darwear to join me to have some fun with Poppy. And there are related, but you could imagine me inv inviting in there who's related to Poppy. That's the closeness we shared. We discussed politics, life, family, among other things which shall not be mentioned here. Such was the stature that persons from all walks of life sought him out and enjoyed his company. I also recall my many weekends journeying to St. Philip to sit with him and have a drink. But prior to my arriving in St. Philip, Poppy will inquire what I wanted to eat. And when I arrived, a big pot of food would be there waiting, not only for me, but for his many other friends whom he would invite. Thank you. Indeed, he loved entertaining and having persons at his home. He enjoyed sharing his space and bunkty with others. My relationship with his grandchildren, Michaela, Marissa, and my dear sweetheart, Anila, Herma, deepen as my friendship with Poppy grew. To the point now that I call her my granddaughter, Anila, seven o'clock at night. She's glued to the news to see Uncle Dwight. That's my sweetheart. While I met Poppy in his adult life as a pharmacist, my interactions with him taught me so much about the ideal characteristics of a good pharmacist. He said a good pharmacist dedicates himself to protecting the dignity of a patient. Poppy was therefore not only a good pharmacist, but a true pharmacist. He had a caring attitude, someone said to him, yes man. He had a caring attitude, a compassionate spirit, and focused on serving all his pa patients in a private and confidential manner. He respected the autonomy and dignity of each individual he served. I'm certain that all of you would join me in saying that since March 23rd, 1993, when Flanders Pharmacy doors opened, it is known for its quality of service to the public, customer-centered focus, approach to individuals, and particularly to working class Barbadians. Flanders Pharmacy is now a household name in Barbados. And it is a true reflection of Poppy Small. Humble, not ostentatious or gimmicky, but professional, and I said, people centered. In December, of the year 2022, just last year, I traveled to the United States of America. I see my very good friend who came in, two good friends who came in and didn't tell me they were coming, but I still love you both, John King and Greg. They're here this morning, friends of Poppy. I think Wesley had his engagement party at Poppy Small home, and he's here from the US. That's testimony to the gentleman. 
I didn't expect to see you this morning. I ad-libbed that. Sorry, that's not part of the speech. In December 2022, I traveled to the United States of America where these guys in entertained me annually with my family on a two-week visit, a vacation. I received a call on January the 3rd, 2023 from Mr. Small requesting me to come and see him. I truly did not tell Mr. Small I was traveling. But then I informed him I am overseas. But he informed me that he was not well and I needed to see him urgently. The sound of his voice weighed on me psychologically during the rest of my trip. And on my return to Barbados, first order of the day was to see Mr. Small. I didn't call the Prime Minister. My first order, didn't even call to tell her it was back. First order of the day was to see Mr. Small. He was not the same in body and mind that I saw in early December of 2022. My visits and telephone calls therefore became more frequent from then until his untimely death. I happened to be by his side many a days. His family can attest to that. Months before his death, on a nightly, daily basis, calls, because I saw the deterioration. I kissed him on his forehead like a father. I hugged him. We talked. And he made one private request of me in the last days and on, this, on his last days on this earth, which I intend to honor. I won't say what that request is, but I will honor it. I close by saying that I have learned a lot from Mr. Small, Poppy Small. One question that stays with me was his constant probing on how I am preparing for life after my political sojourn. He knew that my work on behalf of the people of this country and constituents consumes me, and he sought to impress upon me the importance of work-life balance and being prepared for retirement. When some of his friends complained to him about me, he would tell them, there's a busy man, leave him. Such was the nature of the man and our friendship. He was caring, loving, and imparted wisdom when needed. Poppy Small impacted the lives of many. He saved the lives of many. And he contributed significantly to the health and well-being of many citizens of this country and indeed to the nation. I call him not only my friend and confidant. I call him an unsung hero in this country. I am proud to have known Willis Poppy Small and to have called him my father figure and friend. His teaching moments on many topics will be forever etched in my mind. He proved his friendship in many ways in which he was there as a sounding board for me. And in turn, I hope that I prove to him how much his friendship meant to me. And if I have not proved it to him, and I know I have, his daughters, they have a father. His granddaughters have a father. And his great grand has a grandfather. And Herma, you have a son. He has left us physically, but he will remain in our hearts forever. May our grief be replaced by the cherished more memories that will never fade away. May your soul rest in peace, Poppy, until we meet again, my friend. I love you. I thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Sutherland. We're going to move it on, and we will now have a tribute in song by Ashe. Good morning to everyone. 
Um, before I start, I was made aware that we have found a waistcoat belonging to somebody of the funeral. Um, if you have lost your waistcoat, you can collect it from one of the ushers at the door. Mr. Small, you are a respectable man, and as a fellow lodge person, possant quia posse videntur. That means they can because they think they can, and you thought you could, and you did, and I respect you for that. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me all my days. I've been held in your hands from the moment that I wake up until I lay my head. Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. Cause all my life you have been faithful. In all my life, you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. I love your voice. You have led me through the fire in darkest night. You were close than no other. I loved you as a father. I loved you as a friend. And I will live in the goodness of God. Cause all my life you have been faithful And all my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my mind made up, I surrender now. I give you everything. Cause your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Cause all my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. Cause all my life you have been faithful. In all my life you have been so, so good Every breath that I am able Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God May you rest in eternal peace, Mr. Small Thank you so much, Ashe, and we're going to move now to the other tribute by Randolph Bancroft. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, family and friends. I'm deeply honored and blessed to have known Willie Small, a man who took me into his home with his wife, Herma Small, at an early age of my life and grew me alongside his son, Carla Small, like brothers. He took us to school and provided food on my table every day. Willis, better known as Poppy, took time out to teach me the value of having an education, 
and the mindset of running my own business. He was a blessing in my life, and I will forever carry him in my heart. Poppy had a big heart and have helped many people along his journey of life. As we gather here today to say our last goodbye in flesh, please treasure Poppy in spirit and remember the love he had for each one of us in his own special way. May his soul rest in sweet and eternal peace. Thank you very much. Thank you to everyone who just paid tribute, and we will just watch the slideshow again until the commencement of the service. Thanks once again for coming and showing your support. If you give a little more than you take And if you try to fix more than you break If you're the kind who takes the time to help a stranger in the rain There's a place for people like you if you stand up for those down on their knees And lend a voice to those who cannot speak If you shine a little light, give sight to the ones who've lost their way There's a place for people like you are made of gold And when you get there There's a hand to hold I believe When your day's down here or through There's a place up there For people like you If you walk around with Okay, once again I come back here to just say to you that in the interest of time, we just have a few more minutes, and there's one person in the audience who really wants to say something on the behalf of Mr. Small, and I will not deny him that. So let us just welcome Mr. Hilford Morrill, who will make some remarks on the behalf of Mr. Small. Mr. Morrill? Good evening, everyone. I am confused. <laughs> and this is expected. There comes a time in life when you are asked to make a tribute of your own self. This is the first occasion that I have asked members of the family to be allowed to say something because they usually 
have made arrangements long before the date of the funeral. I have known Poppy for several years, uh, long before he came to acquire a piece of land next door to me uh, in Marchfield. But I can tell you, listening to Poppy throughout his life has already been summarized by what Minister Sutherland has said. However, I have some personal experiences. I would call Poppy my head is hurting. He would not only recommend the tablets, he would bring it. One day I said to Poppy, I have to take the dogs to the vet. Tell me who I can get. He said, man, look, I can send Carlos. And between minutes, you see Carlos with a van and the dogs. I do not think that many people know or understand the man Willis. He had a loving heart. He knows that I do not take alcohol. But he would say, hey, if we come and have a drink, just a tip. But I can assure you, every time he was baking pork chops, he would say, hey, Lee, come on, we have some pork chops. Because he knew that was my love. Today, we have come to pay the last tribute to a man whom I will never forget. All of those who have been associated with Poppy will say one thing about him. He was very kind, he was very caring, and he always remembered his clients. If he came to you and you gave him medication, Poppy will call, how are you feeling now? And to ensure that the medication that was, that was given by the doctor to you has worked. I've had several experiences with him. On one occasion, I had a terrific fever. And I said, I called Poppy. And he said, it has to be A, B, C, or D. And he came up with the medication for A, B, C, and D. Uh, that is the type of person that we have. I didn't come here to make a speech. All I wanted to say on behalf of my family and on behalf of all the friends that we've met together, that we have lost a friend, a loyal friend. All of you who have been associated with Poppy will one day remember of some experience that you had with him. This is not a very good time for me because as I said, I live next door to Poppy. Not I live there now, but I grew up next door to Poppy. And I was very glad when he came and made Marchfield his home because I am a Marchfield man. Like people like Frandell Stores and uh, Adriel Braffitt, all of us are very proud of being Marchfield people. And I was very glad to see that Poppy came and joined that bandwagon. Ladies and gentlemen, it is not a time for me to speak. To be honest with you, I am full of grief. And I may not be able to say what I want to say in the articulate way that I would like. But I just wish all of you to keep and remember your remembrance of himself and his family in your prayers. Poppy has gone, but don't forget the family that he has left behind. I, on behalf of my family and our friends of the law school, I sincerely hope that he will rest in peace and raise in glory.
If you give a little more than you take And if you try to fix more than you break If you're the kind who takes the time to help a stranger in the rain Is a place for people like you If you stand up for those down on their knees And lend a voice to those who cannot speak If you shine a little light, give sight to the ones who've lost their way There's a place for people like you are made of gold And when you get there There's a hand to hold I believe When your day's down here or through There's a place up there For people like you If you walk around With your heart on your sleeve Trying to be the change you want to see If you lay down your life for love So someone could be saved There's a place for people like you I've heard up there the streets are made of gold To hold. I believe when your days down here or through, there's a place up there for people like you. and a wonderful good morning to each and every one of you. Welcome to this service of celebration and thanksgiving for the life of Willis of Neil Small. Let us all stand. I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth, and though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold and not another. God is our refuge and strength, of every present help in trouble. Therefore will we not fear, though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea. Though the waters thereof roll and be troubled, the mountains shake with the swelling thereof. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming, and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though we were dead, yet shall we live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me 
shall never die. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforted us in all our tribulation. That we may be able to comfort them which are in trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. We are so happy to have each and every one of you with us as we offer support to the family and to Sister Small. Reverend Carlos. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. We thank you that it is in you we live and move and have our being. The breath that we breathe, it is yours. And it is yours to give, and it is yours to take. But between the giving and the taking, we give you thanks for all your blessings and mercies and grace and favor. We thank you, God, for the life of Willis and for his witness and the significant contribution he has made to his family, to his friends, his loved ones, and to this society. We thank you, God, for his generosity. We thank you for all that you have allowed him to contribute in this life. And God, over and above that, we thank you for giving him the opportunity to make it right with you and to accept you as Lord and Savior so that in the other life, he will be assured that he will live again. We commit this service into your hands. We pray, God, that you will guide and direct. We commit the relatives, and all the family members, especially his dear wife and granddaughters and his nieces and nephews. We pray, God, that you will comfort them at this time, that your strength will be enough to sustain them during this time of sorrow and loss. You are the God of all comfort. And I pray, God, that your comfort will flow through this entire congregation and that we will understand while weeping will endure for a night. I pray, God, that joy will come in the morning for all of us who are sorrowing. I pray, God, that the peace that passeth all understanding will dwell on us and dwell with us and we will be assured that your grace is indeed sufficient. So, Father, again, we commit the remains of Willis. And we know that you are Lord of the living. And as well, you are Lord of the dead. And we are sure that with him are your everlasting arms. So, God, watch over all of us. And we take this time again to say thank you for his life and to give you praise and to bless your wonderful name in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord and the entire congregation say, Amen. Amen. We will continue our service this morning with the hymn, 
because he lives. So let everyone that has breath join in the singing. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. God sent his son, they call him Jesus, he came to love, he and forgive, he lived and died to buy my pardon. An empty grave is there to prove my Savior lives because he lives. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds the future and life is worth the living just because he lives. How sweet to hold a newborn baby. Feel the pride and feel the pride and joy he gives but greater still the cam assurance this child can face uncertain days because he lives because he lives I can face tomorrow all fear is gone because I know he holds the future and life is worth the living just because he lives and then one day I'll cross the river I'll fight life's final war with pain. And then as death gives way to victory, I'll see the light of glory and I know he lives because he lives. I can face tomorrow. All fear is gone because I know He holds the future. The living just because He lives. Kindly take your seats. We'll just have an insertion here. Um, just before the first scripture reading, Sir Patterson Cheltenham would come and share a tribute on behalf of the family. Uh, good morning, church. And may I extend my deep thanks and appreciation to the family for permitting me to pay this very short tribute to my very good friend and my pharmacist, Poppy Small. In September 1963, a cohort of about 58 or 60 boys came to the Lodge School. And uh, I'd been there the year before, so I took careful note of them. The parish of St. John not only supplied us with competent teachers and a lot of the support staff for the boarding establishment. But it also provided the Lodge School with its best and brightest in terms of boys. Sadly, that is no longer so. 
but we got the finest in intellectual quality from that parish. Henry Fraser, Earl Glasgow, Fred Gollop, all the boys from St. Oscar Jordan and his entire family, straight out of St. John, Busy William Scow, all out of St. John. Get it real, this is what law school was about, this is the law school that I did. So into this cohort of 28, I said 28 because I think it was um, 56, because I think it was days there were 28 boys in the class. I think it went to 30, but just, it wasn't over 60 boys at all, for sure. You had the Graham brothers, sorry, the Graham cousins, Pluto Griffith, Poppy Small, Bernard Marshall, a whole group of them. They were all very bright, and the reason they had to be bright is because to pass for Lodge in those days, you had to get a very, very high mark. The mark for Harrison College and Lodge was the same, I suspect. Queen's College was somewhere around there. So we attracted that quality student. You have to be very careful, however, when you are assessing someone's contribution at school. There are always a lot of factors at play, some of which you don't know. And I will touch on that a little later. So Poppy came in and uh, was largely a well-behaved boy. He wasn't like some persons whom I know who went three times a week for the flog book <laughs> and um, other forms of mischief of which we at large were absolutely notorious. He behaved well. I don't even know if he broke some of society's canes. Probably didn't. I didn't see he didn't suck some. <laughs> but I'm not sure that he broke some. He went through the forms, promotion from prep right up to fifth. And uh, very, when I spoke to some of his contemporaries, I said, but where did Poppy shine in the classroom? He says, well, I'll tell you. Latin and chemistry. You couldn't beat the man. Now this class, by the time they got into four form, the prep forms, had all come together. All the boys in the prep, they, were, they phased them a little. 4A or 4B, he went straight to 4A, which is his natural place. And Desmond Graham, one of his full contemporaries, said to me, boy, when it came to chemistry, he wasn't behind us. You had to look to your right because he was right there with you. He said, Poppy had an uncanny and insightful mastery of chemistry. Now, I consider chemistry to be a difficult subject. It's a lot of reasoning, a lot of fancy formulae that you have to learn. Poppy kissed it like the back of his hand. The other subject which he mastered in a very impressive way was Latin. Now, if you ask most people about Latin, their face would assume a look as though they were taking some salts. <laughs> and Poppy mastered Latin and chemistry. He played cricket, he, I think he bowled fast, and he would probably swipe, which is very effective, get the ball to the boundary. He had a good left foot, a very good left foot. But there was something about Poppy at school where you felt you were only seeing the surface of a great talent. And I think that was in, indeed a true assessment of him as a schoolboy. He was funny in this way. There are two books we kept at Lodge. One, well, there were three. I was familiar with the detention and flog book, so <laughs> confession time. There was also another book which you would go for if you perform exceptionally well. And I think his performance in chemistry and Latin attracted the attention, but particularly in chemistry, of one of his teachers for promotion exams. And they sent copy for that book which you get a strong credit, which will go to your house. And Poppy went and brought the flog book. <laughs> so he, that was Poppy Small, very quiet, very unobtrusive at school in the sense that when you think of the band of, I was going to say band of, you could probably take the other B that we had, he was not with us in that sense. He was almost like a good Sunday school boy. And that was that quiet life he had there. But then he left school in 1969 after being with the first group of boys who wrote the Cambridge exam. And he went to work at Knight's Pharmacy. And I remember 
I would see him in Bridgetown and we would chat. And he told me that he wanted to be a pharmacist. I never had any doubt that he would be a pharmacist. I waited then to see once he became a pharmacist what, how he, well he would acquit himself. He told me he learned a lot from a gentleman called Shenery. His son is Percy Shenery, the lawyer, one of my colleagues. And he told me Mr. Shenery was a very strict man, but a beautiful teacher. And if you wanted to model yourself in terms of being a pharmacist, Shenery was the man to look at. And he certainly imbibed and drank liberally from the cup of Shenery. And I think that is why at the end he became such an outstanding pharmacist. Now, it's the only places I understand apart from when he started his business that he worked. So he worked with knights and uh, there are always strong economic forces at play in life. And once the economic forces are at play, businessmen have to decide how to reposition themselves. Sadly, when they're repositioning themselves, they always look at the conk of employees and say, well, you have to go. So that dreaded one day when you're an employee, that dreaded one day arrived and he was given a letter. Here's your severance calculation. Thanks very much for your service, but goodbye. Don't really come back to the place of work. It should not be taken personally. It's just the market forces at play. And uh, this is really the story with Poppy becomes for me so fascinating. I think he had three choices. He could have ushered in a moment of depression from which he will never have recovered. He could have gone and said, I want a job with someone else. Or he could have gone a road never traveled before and decide, I am going to open my pharmacy. He didn't go a road less travel, as the poet would say. He went a road never traveled before. Little boy, small in name, from small town in St. John, was about to take some huge steps. That's where he came into the picture. We were in the same house at school, and I knew Poppy very well. So he came to see me. He said, Pat, I want to see you. I said, sure, Pops, come over. And he started to tell me about his plans. And like any entrepreneur in the first phase, there's a question of a lot of doubt that surrounds you. There's a question, do you have enough finance? How is this venture going to unfold? Those are the great unknowns. But in spite of that, you must go positive. And he certainly did. He asked me to be his advisor, to form his company, and give him any other legal advice which he wanted. I said, sure, Poppy, let's work with that. He said, I have no money. I said, that's all right. You don't worry about that. That will come in later. And we work beautifully. He started his pharmacy in a relatively small spot. And I thought that the biggest contribution I could make to him was to persuade easily members of my family to go and deal with Mr. Small. And they all went. And it is to see Mr. Small, the pharmacist, that is such a fascinating story. He was there long hours. He was always well stocked. He was knowledgeable. He was patient with persons. And you could always count on him. In fact, my ophthalmologist, when I told him a few weeks ago that Small had died, he says, good heavens, the best pharmacy around, always well stocked. I thought that was a very strong compliment for my man, Poppy. He understood the value of hard work, and his courage here should not surprise you. You see, there was a phenomenon, and I need to touch on this, which occurred in the 50s and the 60s, where there was mass migration, principally to the United Kingdom, less so to USA and Canada. And a lot of parents left their kids here in Barbados with guardians, grandmother, grandfather, and a sister, an aunt in that case. I learned of this in greater detail in later life in which I spoke with at least four lodge boys. 
And I used to ask them a very, two questions I asked them. What was your experience of Lodge? And do you think that you exploited this wonderful educational opportunity which you had? To the first question, they will always say, I love my days at Lodge. If I had to come again in life, back to Lodge with the same boys. That's my experience too. I'll go right back there. To the second question, did you exploit yourself to the maximum? There are different responses. And often when they say, not really, I would look quizzically at them, meaning I wanted more. And that more I extracted from Poppy, and I wouldn't call the other names, but all of them had this in common. Either a mother or father, or in many instances, both had gone to England. Now the experiences were along a continuum or spectrum, and they differed. Some are at the lower end, some are at the upper end, some are in the middle. Common to all of them, and they do not say it. And when you're listening, you have to listen to the unspoken, who is the pain of being separated from the appearance. It was deep, visceral. It hurt, it wounded. Mark you, the parents were interested in economic betterment and they clearly went off to achieve this. What often happened, and there's some extraordinarily painful stories here, is that when funds were remitted, and I'm not saying this is in the case of Bobby, but I know this from some other cases, they were not necessarily directed to the beneficiaries. And children who ought to have been, at a material level at least, relatively comfortable were not necessarily so. That phenomenon of the sixth social phenomenon, migration of the 50s and 60s, came to an end. Afterwards, the Brit says, no, we don't necessarily want you. And the story is well known, and I need not go there. But coming out of that, and this is the significance of this point, is that you fashion a person, whether it be a boy or a girl, there are certain survival instincts you have to develop. You have to look at life and get real with it in a, in a hurry. You don't have the luxury of wallowing. You have to survive. And I think that when Poppy made that decision to go up on his own, that he was very much drawing on some of those experiences in the unsettling period of your life as a teenager. I was able to offer him I would say some half decent professional services. And so I had a client, he had a client, I had a client and he had someone who would, and he would become my pharmacist. We built on that relationship over many years. I thoroughly enjoyed his service. We would meet on evenings after five when he would say the door is closed. Well, it appears to be closed. You need to push it and come in. And Stephen, you would know what I'm talking about. And um, we would go there and touch a range of issues, some printable and some not printable. And, uh, but he was certainly a man whom I was particularly happy to be associated with. He was, just to repeat it, he was knowledgeable, he was kind, he was caring, and he understood the business. Now, let me say, talk about the business. Remember the business was that there were a lot of competing pharmacies. And I always give this scenario to people when I'm giving some general advice. If you see along a quarter mile stretch or a hundred yard stretch, five persons selling coconuts, why is it there's always one that all the cars go to? I always ask people that, what is so, they're all selling coconuts. I don't know how they source them, that's not relevant. But, <laughs> They're all, there's always one, you see all the cars line up and go there. You know what it is? It's the extra factor. If you go to one who greets you, he said, look, there's a, four persons in front of you. By the way, here's a coconut, he gives you a straw. He says, when you finish it, you can press there and wash your hand. And he says, thank you. Those are elements you're not going to see with the others, and you're going to like that. He recognizes you as a client, 
He wants you to be happy and he's offering a quality service. Poppy may not have articulated it that way, but it was in substance, it was no different. There was something about his service that was just purely special. And I was particularly happy to watch this boy who grew up with me at Lord's School. I had just started my practice and he was happy to come to me. He had enough confidence in me. And I was happy to support him and encourage several others so to do. Now, the question is, let me look at my scribbles here. He found a winning formula. There was a lot of growth in his business and growth presents problems because then you realize that you, as the sole provider, you need to have assistance. And I think it was clear enough to ensure that he brought in some additional pharmacists to help. And there comes a time also when you become exhausted from all your efforts. and You tend to stay at home a little more and leave it to others. I know that I've been through the same experience. Long, brutal hours, but the key that he had was attitude, attitude, attitude. I often say, if I am hurrying you, I'm hurrying you on attitude. Because if you have the right attitude, I can build on that attitude to make you into a good technician. Poppy was an exemplar in that regard. Attitude, attitudes. Because in a small space like Barbados, word spreads, and the word went around. That Small's Pharmacy was a good place to go. And when he moved to a greater space, you should see the crowds in there. It was a tribute to a successful venture, a very successful venture. Warm, generous, spirited, successful in his creation, he leaves a legacy worthy of study to explore the ob its obvious strengths and areas where there can be betterment. I have lost a friend and my pharmacist. I take comfort in that I've been associated with him for longer than many of you. I take joy in having known him. May he rest in peace, but I cannot, in fairness to Poppy, in this speech in English. I have to respect his Latin, quiescat in pace. Thank you very much. Okay, we will continue with the first scripture by Marvin McCall. The lesson is taken from John chapter 14, verses 1 through 6, verses 26 and 27. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. That where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, and the way you know, Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going, and how can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring your remembrance all things that I said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. The word of the Lord. Kindly stand with me as you sing the hymn Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound.
Good morning. Good morning. <clears throat> when, <laughs> when all my days are numbered, and I'm gone and out of sight, my body light and unused costume, no longer holding in my light. Don't look down in sorrow, look to the sky above, and remember all my good deeds, the good times, and the love. Lay me down among, among the, the poppies. poppies. Let the sun rise warm my chest, but remember me with laughter, all the things you like the best. My life, it weaved a story, laced with wisdom, love, and heart. Now the story's yours for telling, so please keep alive my part. Remember me Remember me with feeling, tell tales of all my lore. Be grateful for my company, and I'll live forevermore. It doesn't matter about the life you live. If you save it yet, have nothing to give. When you say that you are acting in love, yet your desires come from the world and not from above. It doesn't mean much if what you speak isn't true. If the only person you're pleasing is you, a life is only well lived and well mean so much when it is measured by all the people you touch. If in the end you are measured by what stays in your hand, then those, will, then those who have nothing have lived a life that is grand. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning again, church. The second scripture reading is taken from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 50 to 58. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised, incorruptible, and we shall be changed. 
For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written. Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren and friends, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. This is the word of God. Thank you. We're, going to, we're not going to have our eulogy by Stephen Wiltshire, and after that we'll have a solo by Kelly Kadakin. Ladies and gentlemen, this morning, the task, I would not say pleasant or unpleasant, I said the task is mine to deliver the eulogy of my dear friend, Poppy Willis Small. Before I go any further, I must recognize and acknowledge the presence, of which you have already heard, of the Honorable Chief Justice and the other Honorable Members of Parliament, Minister Sutherland, past members, present members, and also Minister of Agriculture. And I would like to say that Life through all the changing things of life. Now we have a wide cross section of people here, beginning from the Chief Justice at top, right away down to if he were alive, I'm sure we would have had Errol Crawford here this morning. All of these are people that Poppy Small Life touch. Lives of great men all remind us. We can make our lives to blind and depart and leave behind us footprints in the sands of time. Poppy Small is there lying. He is our unsung hero. We just had heroes there, but the hero Poppy Small was is reflected in this audience today. And I'm proud that I could be associated with him. I would not go on the large school set. You have ably heard his school days and everything at large school demonstrated, rehearsed, and so on by no lesser person than the Honorable Chief Justice. But what he forgot to say about Poppy Small large school days was that Poppy Small had a path that he used it to tread on mornings and evenings going to law school. And the Chief Justice would not know that. And on this path was a lovely lady who used it. She wasn't a lady then, she was a, well, a young lady. She used it to be on either in a rock or someplace hiding, but she was on that trip, on that track. And that is why Poppy Small used it to walk that track on mornings. <laughs> And on that track, that lady that was there was no less a person than Herma Bancroft then. <laughs> and Poppy would walk that trip on mornings and on evenings, going to school with a smile, seeing Herma and feeling good. Those were his 
his young years. And I can say she was, in her earlier days, she still is beautiful now, but in her earlier days, I could see why Poppy looked at her. <laughs> and Poppy continued that love and that look and took it into his adult life, and the rest is no history. He took Herma down the aisle, and she became Mrs. Small. And that union provided one kid. That was Carlos. We'll get back to that. But the point I'm, I'm trying to illustrate is here that Poppy Small was left behind. When I say left behind, his father looked through the district called Small Town. And in that district called Small Town, there was a house owned by the husbands. And in that house, there were some damsels, some ladies and gentlemen. And he picked out the loveless, oh, I don't let me say the loveless, I may think. And he picked out one of them, and that was Lavelle. And Garfield and Lavelle started life. And the results of the union of Garfield and Lavelle was Poppy really small. And this is where this champion, this hero, this great man, his life began. From those two people, Garfield and Louvain. But like everything else, Garfield went to England in search of betterment for his family. And he sent for his lovely wife. She joined him. And Poppy was left to be raised by his grandmother, his aunt, and his uncles. And we can see their contribution to him because those people were the making of our hero here, Poppy Small, a giant of a man. And I will explain to you why he was a giant of a man. He took that early nourishment, that early family nourishment, and conveyed it and took it into life. And, well, he went to Lodge. I will say nothing more about Lodge. What I can say about Lodge is, I am a proud member of the Freemasons Association. <laughs> and in the Lodge, we recognize the charitableness of people. And when we looked at the char charitableness of Poppy Small, he was, to me, a good candidate for a Mason to join the Lodge. And my good friend, I approached him on it. And you know what Poppy Small told me? He said, I went to Lodge already. <laughs> and that was the end of the story about Poppy Small in Lodge. He and all of his Lodge friends, the Honorable Chief Justice, the, uh, uh, and all, all, the, all the others, the Honorable Minister of Housing, and on and on, Edward G. Prescott, so I say nothing more about Lodge. Now we moved on from Lodge. Now I can speak from my heart about Poppy Small. We lived together. We did many things together. And Poppy Small continued from school when Poppy Small went that morning to write his pharmacy exams. I was the person who took him there. Poppy went on and he became a pharmacist. After becoming a pharmacist, I remember he told me one morning, he was at nights, yes. And Shenry, a man he had a lot of respect for, took him from Broad Street and took him to People's Pharmacy and introduced him and gave him to no less a person than Marjorie Elcock, who later became Marjorie, Marjorie McCaskey. And she was one of the persons who helped to mold Poppy into pharmacy in, I had to make this unsung hero here the man that he was, Marjorie McCaskey. And Poppy worked at Knights, Broad Street, Peoples, and Sunset Crest. And what he took with him was the loving nature of him. Many an evening we were, I was there waiting for him, we were coming home, and what happened? He had to make a detour. Poppy delivered medication from Bath, Bathsheba, 
Baskerville, Black Rock, Pilgrim Road, anywhere. When he had a patient, they would leave the prescription, puppies would take it and fix it. Many evenings, yes, I was at Lantax. I knew the island as a valuer. And some of the alleys that we went in with puppies, I rambled many evenings. Many nights, I remember night puppy and I went delivering medication in the bowels of St. Joseph. And we got lost and we asked the man a question and the man sent us rambling further. <laughs> That did not turn the mind of this great unsung hero. He also was an ambassador for Barbados. In St. James, when he worked at Sunset Crest, there was a doctor down there, Dr. Cyril Nelson. And Dr. Cyril Nelson used it to attend to patients at Sandy Lane and some of the other hotels. And many evenings, we were coming home, and the doctor would call and said, Ask Smalley, put off this medication here, Farmer. I see us there driving into Sandy Lane, into other hotels and so on, delivering medication to foreigners who then would leave and go abroad and sing the song of the goodness of people in Barbados. That is why I say lives of great men all remind us we can make our lives sublime and departing leave behind us footprints in the sands of time. Poppy have left footprints that not even the Chief Justice can walk into. <laughs> Poppy have left footprints that not even Hilful Murrell can walk into. I would not add myself to the equation, but <laughs> I can say I went along with him and helped him forge some of those footsteps. And if I had to be here for the rest of the morning, I'm sure we would get up 3 o'clock for this evening if I had to. But I won't bear you with that. I will say as much as the other thing about Lodge, what Poppy treasured was the day his son walked into Lodge. And when Carlos went into Lodge, I knew the joy that Fort Poppy felt to see his son was walking in his footsteps. Well, we are accustomed to sons burying fathers, but it happened the other way around, that the, fa that the father buried the son. And he was not left lonely or, lonely or childless because Carlos probably had some divine intervention and he made sure he did not leave his father alone. He gave him two beautiful daughters. You heard them here just now raising the poem. And so from, from Poppy and Carlos, there we have the two, the two daughters. And the two daughters, have, uh, one of them have already decided that in the name of Poppy, she herself have shown Poppy the third the, uh, generation of smalls. And I am very happy. I'm, I do not want to see a wet eye in here today. This is a life of celebration. Uh, I am doing it. I re yes, I know I'm in church. I am doing it the way of Frank Sinatra. I like the words of Frank Sinatra. When Frank Sinatra penned, I am doing it my way. So I am here delivering the eulogy to my friend this morning. I am doing it this Stephen Wilcher's way. It's, I am not going in any book. I am doing it my way. And I am singing the unsung praises of a national hero. We delivered medication from Boss Cabell, as I said, Clean Kit St. Lucy. Many evening, her and home waiting from Poppy, and we in the bowels of St. Thomas and all about delivering medication. Could you want some, some person more genuine and caring and generous than that? And anyhow, I can speak for the rest of the day, but I wouldn't. Poppy continued in his life until in the end, like everything else, health has to fail us. Like everything else, we have to go. There were a lot of people who made contributions to him, who he worked with. He worked with Barbara Fenty. He worked with Al Alling, Carver uh, Hudson. And there's a fellow, 
pharmacists. I know them because of my, my association with Poppy, and I have promised not to call too many names because I may deliberately or intentionally or inadvertently left out a name and there he said, oh, you call this body one and not mine. But all of those that worked with Poppy, this unsung hero, it is on his behalf that I can speak today. And, and it is on his behalf I can speak today. And I know that we have lost him. We have, I have lost a personal friend. Herma has lost a husband. The, the grandchildren has lost a grandfather. But he has made his mark. The lives that he has touched today, this is eternal evidence to it. I have been to funerals where three or four, the only people they had were three or four mourners who lift the coffin. Look in here today, look. Everybody out to acknowledge, acknowledge the goodness of Poppy Willis Small. And I can keep talking. Down to the end of his day, two things that I will always remember. The night Poppy Small died, I was there at his bed. And we had Dr. Maynard. I saw that young doctor spring into action. And that young doctor held him. She pumped in, she rolled him, she massaged him. She did everything she could to him. But his time was up, and he succumbed. And when she realized that Bobby Small had passed, I saw the pain itched in her face. And what she did, she looked wrong at her husband who was behind her. And I saw a maid be lame, boom, and fell into his arms. The arms were scrawny, not as big as mine. But he <laughs> held her up, and she... And he gave her the sucker and support that she needed at, the, at that time. She did not only see it as the loss of a patient, but she saw it as the loss of Poppy Small. The man Poppy Small sent, helped send to school many a child, I can tell you. He bought school books for many a child. He helped repair many a, many a car. He helped pay many, rent for many, a, many an apartment. He got paid in various kinds. I won't say all the kinds he got paid in. <laughs> some people, some people, some people brought him mangoes by the box. Others brought him potatoes by the bag. I ate some of them. And they all paid him, repaid him, however they want to repay them. He got the payment, not me. But that is Poppy Small, my good friend, and the man, the unsung hero, who have touched many lives. The footsteps, lives of great men all remind us we can make our lives sublime. And the parting leaves behind us, footprints in the sands of time. Now, I don't want to keep you here till tonight. So I am going to wrap up and come home. I know I have left out. I have not told you about his love, his love for dogs. He has the dog loving uh, element of him. His love for race horsing, his love for dominoes. He did not lose the common touch. In spite of being a pharmacist, Poppy Small would sit there and play dominoes with Ansel, Bernard, and, and enjoy himself on the dominoes game. Many a night he beat me on the table tennis board. He was taller than I, and we would play table tennis and see Poppy come hit, hitting the ball from oh. <laughs> poor me, short and down here. I just had to let it go through. <laughs> mm -hmm. That was Poppy Small. During the crop season, many a year, with his grandparents in venture, he and I, James, Anthony, we would go and help cut canes and lowered them, that was the Poppy Small. A man not losing the common touch 
a man that would come and prepare medication for patients, a man that would deliver that medication. There we are cutting canes and loading them. That was Poppy Small. And not only that, we built one on the weekends when it was house building time, we built houses. It turned mortar, it turned concrete. That was Poppy Small. And he did not forget to walk among respectable men like the Honorable Chief Justice, Dwight Sutherland. And one thing, he kept his political line neutral. On the other side, was minister, used it to be Minister Estwick, but it didn't matter, he kept his political line neutral. And I will say that then along with the dogs, there was also the rabbit side of him. He kept, and he would always try to tell me that he was this cook. He would cook. And I know that all the cooking skills were not his. And the final estimate, he did what he had to do. And I am not going to say much more. But it's at this time that... I am, I am going to leave the rest for the priest to say, but let me start him first. You know, this story, I want you to have fond memories of Poppy Small. That is why I said, I am Stephen Wiltshire, and I am doing this eulogy how? My way. And therefore, in doing it my way, I'm closing it my way also. You know, this story is told that this preacher was preaching, and he had a lively song, him singing service. And he told the congregation, when I say a word, you raise a hymn. And he said, blood. And they started out, the blood prevails, the blood of the risen Lord. And I'm going to say much more than that. <laughs> then he said, hell. And they said, there's a green hill far away. And he continued right down. And he said, trumpet. They said, when the trumpet of the Lord shall sound. I think, I'm not a great singer. But then he came down to the word sex. <laughs> and when he said sex, not a word was said. Nobody could raise a song on sex. <laughs> there was a half minute of silence. A whole minute of silence, and nobody could raise a word on sex. Then there was an old lady in the back row, bent with age, not a tooth in her mouth and a wig on her head, and walking with a cane. And that old lady got up from the back seat and walked to the center of the aisle. And she straightened up and she bellowed. Precious memories. <laughs> How they linger, how they ever flood my soul. When in the midnight or the morning, precious memories, joys untold. So I want you to leave in here with a smile on your face. Not a dry, not a wet eye, but go and have precious memories about Poppy Small. Now I must give you the commercial. Poppy Small have left a legacy. That is Flanders Pharmacy. And the same way that you supported Poppy Small when he was alive, I'm expecting you to continue to support Prophet Small. The least you can do in his memory. So to the staff of Flanders, I on his behalf recognize and say and thank you. I don't want to get in name calling because they're getting more name calling. I'm going to leave out this person. I'm going to leave out the next person and then that. So to the entire Flanders staff, Let's continue, not only in our staff, past and present. So the past staff will be Barbara Fenty, and we'll continue with the others. To the entire Flanders staff, we mourn the loss of Poppy Small, 
but he is or he was our unsung hero. Uh, he was a great man. Lives of great men, including Poppy Small, all remind us we can make our lives too blind. And departing, leave behind us footprints in the stands of time. Ladies and gentlemen, I had my say. I have said enough. I now hand you into the hands of the priest who will try to, try to get you elsewhere. But I say what I had to say. So the good memories of my dear friend. He has left a void here. So the good memories of my dear friend. Hope small. Rest in peace. Rise in glory. And we will meet you on the other side. Good morning. I had my laugh, and I just hope, didn't he do well? Give him, give him a round of applause, because I just think that it was so fitting, and it's always good to be able, even though it's a time of mourning, it's a good time to be able to smile and have great memories. And the song I'm going to deliver for you this morning is one that I hope that during your difficult times, that you can look to Jesus. As I lay me down, heaven hear me now, I am lost without a cause, after giving it my all. Winter storms have come, and darkened my sun. After all that I've been through, who on earth can I turn to? I look to you. I look to you. After all, my strength is gone. In you I can be strong. I look to you. you and when melodies are gone in you I hear a song I look to you about to lose my breath no more fighting left, sinking to rise no more. I'm searching for that open door. And every road that I've taken has led to my regret. And I don't know if I'm gonna make it. Nothing to do but lift my head I look to you I look to you Yeah After all my strength is gone In you I can be strong I look to you I look to you And when melodies are gone, in you I hear a song, I love to you.
to you After all my strength is gone In you I can be strong I look to you far spent so I'll take the few remaining moments to share with you a message of hope from the word of God kindly bow your heads and pray with me now dear father let the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight O Lord our strength and our redeemer amen I've captioned my presentation Nothing in this life is forever. When you go home, you can read it in its entirety. Focus on my message from the book of Daniel, chapter 2. A king namely Nebuchadnezzar, had a dream. A dream that was very significant to him. But he could not remember the dream. He had in his realm some men that he often shared the thoughts, the things that troubled his mind, and they were always able to concoct an answer. But God was in charge of this dream this time. And he knew it was significant, but he just could not recall what the dream was. And so he called all of the magicians and the sorcerers and the soothsayers, those persons who claim to have the ability to peer, to peep into the future. And he said, I want you to tell me the dream. I dreamt something last night, but I just can't recall what it was I dreamt. Tell me the dream. Tell me what it was that I dreamt, but I can't recall. And not only tell me the dream, but tell me the interpretation thereof. If you fail to, you will be cut in pieces. For the very first time. Perhaps I want to say by extension, all those who still purport to be wise men, astrologers and soothsayers and magicians. One day you'll meet the same fate as these men. The only one who knows the future is God. And hence Daniel was considered to be, even though he was not in the king's court, he was considered to be one of the wise men. So he was about to meet the same fate as these Obia men. And word got to Daniel and Daniel said, why is the king so hasty about this dream? Why is it so significant to him? And Daniel went to Ariok, the king's captain, and said, give me a little time. Tell the king, give me a little time, and I will talk to my God because I serve a God who knows the future. Amen. And he called Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. You would know them by their 
popular Babylonian names, Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego. And they prayed and God gave them the dream and the interpretation. Remember the king had forgotten. So here's Daniel now before the king saying, this is what you dreamt, O king. You saw in the dream that you dreamt and have forgotten an image of a man. And the king said, yes, that's what I saw. And the man's head was of gold. Yes, the king said. And his chest and his arms were of silver. Yes, I saw that. And his belly and his thighs were of brass. And he said, yes, I saw that. And his legs were of iron. Yes. And his feet part of iron and part of clay. Thou sawest, O king, until a stone was cut out with our hands and struck the image on its feet and it scattered everything. Here's the interpretation of the dream. Your kingdom, Babylon, is represented by that head of gold. I can imagine the king smiling from ear to ear. Golden kingdom. As a matter of fact, if you were to read Daniel chapter 3, you would see him trying to defy God. God said, look, your kingdom is represented by the head of a gold. In Daniel chapter 3, the king was actually saying to God, you say that my kingdom will only be for a time, but I'm going to prove to you that my kingdom will be forever. So in Daniel chapter 3, he made an image of pure gold, 90 feet tall, and said, every man jack, you would come and bow down. And if you fail to bow down, you shall be cast into a burning fiery furnace. You remember that there were three men who just couldn't bow down. They had steel in their backs, namely Hananiah, Mishael, and Azar. The same Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So Daniel said, O king, your kingdom, Babylon, will be one of the four world empires that would exist. Only four, not five or six. There will only be four empires that will stretch from your time right down to the end of time. 605 BC to 538 BC was the reign or the time of Babylon. By this time, Belteshazzar was king. He thought that he was so powerful. As a matter of fact, one night the word of God says that he was drinking wine with his, his wives and his concubines and in the midst of his drunken debauchery, his kingdom was overtaken. 331, Babylon had gone. But Daniel said, after Babylon will be another kingdom of silver, inferior to you. Represented by the Medes and the Persians, the next world empire. But Daniel said to the king, but after the Medes and the Persians. That lasted from 538 to 331 BC. There will be another kingdom. Kingdom of brass, represented by the belly and the thighs of brass. Greece was the next kingdom, 331 to 168 BC. Greece was overtaken by Rome. Rome from 168 BC until 476 AD. That was the time when Jesus was born. With the Herods and the Caesars. But Daniel continued to explain the dream because that dream not only held significance for the king, but it holds significance for those of us who are living in 2023 and beyond. Daniel said to the king, O oh king, after these kings, after Rome, there has never been another one kingdom that ruled the world. Hitler came, tried Stalin, Mussolini. But then Daniel said to the king, Thou sawest the ten toes, the feet of ten toes, part clay and part iron. And just as iron and clay cannot mix together, those kings after the fall of Rome, those countries represented the countries of Europe. The 
Lombards and the Visigoths and the Astrogoths and the Alemanni and the, the Anglo-Saxons. Eventually, they form themselves. The word of God says, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave together. I could have told the leaders of Europe, and I can tell them now, that you would never have a Europe that would be united. That's why Britain has gone Brexit. All the others will be dismantled. The word of God says that. But let me get to the sermon today. Daniel said, in the midst of all these, God, he saw a stone cut out without hands that came and struck the image. And that represents the kingdom of God that will be established upon this world. All the others. So Babylon has gone. Medo-Persia has gone. Greece has gone. Rome has gone. The next great thing to happen, my brothers and sisters, will be the establishment of the kingdom of God. And Jesus came here to fulfill that mission. After man sinned, every woman who was impregnated in the Old Testament was hoping that she was carrying within her womb that special child. Those were the days when little boys were made of sugar and spice and all that's nice. Somehow it got mixed up. I mean, hear that girls are made of that. But every woman then was hoping that the child she was carrying could be that deliverer, that savior. Eventually Jesus was born, came and lived here on this earth. He said, my kingdom is not of this world. My kingdom is out of this world. He came just on time as the word of God says. Lived amongst men for 33 and a third years lived on the earth. Opened the eyes of the blind. Opened the ears of the deaf. Caused the dumb to walk, to talk and the lame to walk. Stopped one day a funeral procession. A woman was going to bury her only son and brought him back to life. You know, most of the people back in Jesus' day did not even believe him. There was a general thought that many of the people that Jesus brought back to life were just coincidental. That they were deeply comatose and he just happened to turn up at the right time when they were coming out of the coma. He didn't do anything extra special. So one day, while he was out on the itinerary, he heard that his friend Lazarus had died. I know me tell folk look, as, a, as a pastor, anytime I hear sickness or whatever pastor come, everything else comes to a screeching halt. I'm there. But Jesus heard that his friend Lazarus was sick unto death. Come now. And he didn't turn up the first day. He didn't turn up the second day. He didn't turn up the third day. He turned up the fourth day. As a matter of fact, Lazarus was already buried. He was decomposing. So much so that when Jesus went into the cemetery, Martha said, Jesus, but you've come too late. But I'm telling you, my brothers and sisters, my Jesus is never too late. He's always on time. He went in that cemetery and said, where have you laid him? One Christian writer said that if Jesus had gone into that cemetery and said, come forth, every dead man and woman would have come up. But he went for Lazarus. He said, Lazarus, it is you that have come forth. Come forth. Four days. Already stinking the word of God says. But Lazarus heard the voice of the life giver and he came forth. Then Jesus, he himself, was nailed to a cruel cross. You are king, we're going to give you a crown of pimplers, thorns. As a matter of fact, before that, they had a choice. Do you want us to set Jesus free? Or Barabbas, who was in jail for murder. And the people said, no, we don't want 
the one who can open the eyes of the blind. We don't want the one who can take a little boy's lunch that was intended for his stomach alone but feed 5,000 men plus women and children. We don't want the one who can open the eyes of the blind. We don't want the one who can turn water into wine. We want the murderer. Get rid of Jesus. Nail him to the cross. Friday, we just celebrated that recently. He was nailed to the cross. All day Saturday, Sabbath, he was in the tomb. Sunday morning, as a matter of fact, Friday evening, Mary and Martha, who had prepared spices and ointments for his embalming, when they went down to, 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 to embalm him, the sun was already setting. And the word of God says they went back home and kept the Sabbath according to the commandment. But early Sunday morning, they turned up at the, at the graveside. And when they got there, they found that Jesus was no longer there. I am glad that Mary and Martha didn't find him. He was not there because he was no longer dead. He was alive. I can join with the songwriter and say, I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. But Jesus had said that. Destroy this temple. And after three days, it will rise again. And not only did he come from the grave, but the word of God says he brought forth some trophies, some other persons who were dead. But that's not all. He had told his disciples, look, in John chapter 14, one of our scripture passages, let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That kingdom that Daniel talked about, cut up without, without hands, stone cut up without hands, and struck the image. I'm saying, brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, that is the kingdom of God. Did Jesus go? I'm here to report to you this morning. All the other great men, the pharaohs are still in their pyramids. All the other great men of the world are still encased in tombs. But I'm glad that on that resurrection morning, when Mary and Martha went there, the grave clothes were neatly folded. And one, one visitant said, he's no longer here. He is risen. Our God is not dead. He is alive. Amen. Told his disciples, I go to prepare, prepare a place for you. Has he gone? In Acts chapter 1, verses 9 to 11, the word of God says, that while Peter and James and John were there with him in conversation, all of a sudden gravity lost its hold and Jesus started going up on plain air and two angels stood by them in white apparel and said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye there gazing up? into heaven this same Jesus with the nail prints in his hand this same Jesus that bore the scars from the sword in his side the same Jesus that still bore the scars from the crown of thorns in his head that you see go up visibly and literally he will so come again visibly and literally as you see him go he's coming again I know that brothers and sisters I don't want to ask you the question today if he were to come today, is it well with your souls? Have you made any preparation for his coming? I'm glad that my good friend of 40-something years, Arlene, told me that he made that commitment to Jesus. You see, brothers and sisters, nothing in this life is forever. All of what you have, you're going to go and leave on these days. The only thing you're going to take to heaven with you is a character. Either you make it with Jesus or you don't make it. So Jesus has gone to prepare that place. <laughs> you know, the last of his disciples, Peter and all the others, were, met some cruel deaths. Peter himself thought it was a dishonor to be crucified like Jesus was on the cross. So he chose to be crucified upside down, feet up, head down. But not all. The word of God says that John, the last of the disciples, 
That disciple, when Jesus was on the cross, said, Woman, behold thy son, son, behold thy mother. And that's why he entrusted the care of his mother in the hands of John. That last disciple, they put him in a pot of oil, a big pot that can hold a human being to fry him. The oil failed to make any impression upon John's skin. Only made his skin look as though he had put on some Jersey's lotion. Took him out. And the word of God says he was placed on an island in the Asian sea called Patmos all by himself. But while he was there, he received a visitation from a heavenly visitant. Jesus himself came down. And as it were, he gave John a peep down into the future. He pulled back the curtain that separates the present from the future. And John was able to look down to the end of time. And when John looked and he saw, he wrote in Revelation chapter 21, he says, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth for this old, corrupt, wicked confused bewitching world will pass away god will make a new heaven and a new earth but he must have persons in that kingdom who will have a new heart too you can't just get there anyhow when jesus went up he didn't go up on an elon musk or a richard branson spacecraft you can't fly you can't pay your way to get to heaven all the money that you have. On where they said if religion was a thing that money could buy, who would live? And what would happen to me and you? <laughs> we would die. The poor would die. But I'm glad, brothers and sisters, that the price for our salvation has already been paid. It has been paid by the precious blood of Jesus. And when Jesus Christ comes, you see, the world is divided into two categories. You're either in one or the other. Either you're saved or you're lost. Either you're going to heaven or you're going to hell. There's no in between. There's no limbo. By the way, that's a teaching that came in via room to make some money for the church. And when you're dead, if you ain't good enough for heaven, are you not bad enough for hell? You go into this in-between place called limbo. And only the priest can get you out. Pray you out. But let me tell you something, brothers and sisters. The word of God says, Jesus has already paid the price. You don't have to pay for your salvation. All you need to do is to make that choice. A closing here. So there are two categories. You are either on the side of Jesus today or you are on the side of the enemy. Either or. Jesus says there are two roads in life. Matthew 7 verse 13 to 14. And he says, look, one is broad and all accommodating. The other one is narrow. As a matter of fact, he says, look, Enter ye in at the straight gate. That is not S-T-R-A-I-G-H-T. That is S-T-R-A-I-T from a Greek word that means enter in at the difficult gate. For broad is the way. And wide is the way. That leads to life. Damnation. But straight is the gate. And narrow is the way. That leads to life. And only a few are going to make it. And you're going to make it, brothers and sisters, by the blood of Jesus Christ. Thank God. The next great thing to happen is the coming of Jesus. The word of God says that when he comes again, there are many who are going to be running to the rocks and to the mountains. Will you be in that group? And many others will be running to the rock of ages. Jesus himself. You determine. Nobody else can. All I'm here to tell you, my friends, when you've breathed your last breath, 
thank God for my brother's decision. But when you've breathed your last breath, there ain't nothing. And it emphasizes, there ain't nothing that no priest, no pastor, no bishop, no pope, nobody. Once you come dead, crapo, smoke your pipe. No change. That change has to be made while you are alive. And I believe today here, there are many individuals that if Jesus were to come, you know it is not well with your soul. There are many of you who once attended church, but you asked the Lord for a little time, and you ain't get back yet. You want to get down behind the truck. You want to drink the rivers dry. Every skirt or every pants that pass, you want. Or should I say for some men, well, males, every pants that pass, you want too. And for some ladies, every skirt that pass, you want too. And let me tell you, if, nobody, if in the past, never tell you, tell you, let me tell you today. If you are not following the will of God, hell is going to be hot for you. Jesus make the male and female. I tell my congregation, if you come before me to get married, and what your body parts are, ain't different from the other person, get from in front of me. A man must have man parts. And a woman must have woman parts. Because in the beginning, God made them male and female, not male and he male. And for all those ministers or who claim to stand up and to approve wrong, you too, God is going to deal with you. Wrong is wrong and right is right. Thank God my Jesus is coming soon. Let me pray with you. Brethren, I know that there's some of you who have not yet made that commitment. And you perhaps once walked with the Lord. You don't serve him now. And you need to get back there. Heaven is real. John saw it. He said there's no got any sickness there. No arthritis there. No cancer there. No death there. I have booked my passage. 1978. And it's my determination by the grace of God. That as long as he lends me breath. I will stay faithful to him. Because I can't imagine in my mortal mind. What it's like to live eternally. I want to live forever. No sickness, no pain, no undertaker, only the upper taker. Are you listening to me? You too, there's plenty of room in heaven for you. But you've got to make up your mind. Your father can't get you there. Your position in the world can't get you there. All the money that you have can't get you there. The only way you can get there is by the grace of God. And I'm glad my brother has made book his passage. And I say to his family, look, look, you too, if you want to see him again. Because the word of God says that when he comes again, all those who die in Christ, when Jesus Christ comes again, not every dead man in the grave coming up, you know. The word of God says in 1 Thessalonians, for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout of the voice and the voice of your angel. And the dead in Christ shall rise. There's some graves in Coleridge that will not be disturbed when Jesus Christ comes on resurrection morning. Because those are persons who never made a commitment while they're alive. You, don't, you can't serve Jesus when you're dead. you got to do it while you're alive. If you want to come up in Christ, you got to go down in Christ. I challenge you today, don't leave this. But let this day, be the 13th of May, be recorded in the Lamb's Book of Life. That you book your passage for heaven today. You used to go to church, get back there. You never went before, get in there. Because if... You close your eyes without making that decision. That's it. You will hear from Jesus 
not in the first resurrection, but in the second resurrection of damnation. May God help us all to be there. Could you see the hands of all those? You really want to be with Jesus and to live with him when he comes? Could I see your hands? Oh, bless the Lord. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Father, we have seen those hands today. You can read the thoughts and the intents of their hearts. Lord, you know that they dearly, they really want to be there when you come. Lord, there may be things about their lives that is not right right now. But I pray to God that you will help them by your grace to overcome. So that when the role is called up yonder, they'll be there. In the meanwhile, I pray that you will put your loving arms around Herma, all the grands and the other family members, and let them know that even though weeping may endure for a night, joy cometh in the morning. Be their source of comfort and solace, and help them, Lord, to look to that day when you will come, when death will be no more. Until then, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the fellowship and the communion of the Holy Spirit rest and abide with us now and forevermore. Amen. Hallelujah. Gracious God, thank you, Pastor Padmore. We're going to bow our heads as we're going to say another short prayer for the family. There's still hope. Amen. If you're not going to church, get there. If you're going, continue to go. In Jesus' name. Our Heavenly Father, our gracious God, Father, we lift Sister Small before you. We lift this family before you. We pray, God, that you will continue to strengthen them. God, you will continue to bless them. Father, they have lost a loved one. But God, you are still on the throne as we have heard this morning. And I pray, God, they will look to you, the author. You are the beginner God of their faith. Father, help them to look to you, God, to strengthen them. Strengthen, O oh God, the grandchildren, the great grand, O oh God, the sisters. Strengthen them in the name of Jesus. Father, we pray for the workers of Anders Pharmacy. We pray, God, that you will continue to bless them as well. Father, they will surround these granddaughters, O oh God. Father, that you will make that pharmacy to go from strength to strength. Father, that we as a congregation will continue to support them in Jesus' name. Father, I thank you so much from the depths of our hearts, O oh God, for how you will move, God. And Father, how they will stand still and see the salvation of the God that they serve. And God, as they have heard the word this morning, if they don't know you as Lord and Savior, I pray, God, they will make that decision to know you and to live for you. In Jesus' name, we pray with thanksgiving. Amen and amen. We want to thank each and every one of you for coming out and supporting the family this morning. We thank you, ministers of parliament, former senators, former senator, Brother Caswell, Chief Justice, Dwight Sutherland, Senator, senator Sutherland, senator, sorry, Minister Sutherland, Minister Weir. We thank you. I think I saw former, senator, former minister top in there as well. We thank each and every one of you for coming out and supporting the family. For all of those from the Lord's School, we thank you as well for coming out and offering your support. May God bless each and every one of you richly. May you continue to keep Sister Small and her family in prayer. For all of those who did a special, we thank you, Kelly. In Jesus' name, we want to thank you, Stephen, for your words of comfort, your eulogy. You said you did it your way, and we appreciated that. So let us all stand as we do a recessional hymn. That will be, I'll fly away.
If you give a little more than you take And if you try to fix more than you break If you're the kind who takes the time to help a stranger in the rain There's a place for people like you If you stand up for those down on their knees And lend a voice to those who cannot speak If you shine a little light, give sight to the ones who've lost their way There's a place for people like you I've heard up there the streets are made of gold And when you get there, there's a hand to hold I believe when your day's down here or through There's a place up there for people like you If you walk around with your heart on your sleeve. Let us pray. Father, today, as we're about to lay our friend Willis to rest, we ask that you would continue to be with his loved ones, his friends, and to assure them, Lord, that you will not leave them nor forsake them. So we commit this service in your hands now we ask in Jesus name for as much as Willis Othniel Small have laid down the cares of this life we do tenderly commit his body to the ground earth to earth ashes to ashes dust to dust we believe that all the issue of issues of life are in the hands of a loving caring Savior and hence we commit him in the hands of of this loving Jesus. Jesus said to his disciples, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there ye may be also. We've been assured by the word of God. That when Jesus Christ comes, that those who die in Christ shall rise first. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. John said, and I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. John saw that there would be no more sickness, no pain, no suffering, no more death, and that God himself would wipe away all tears from our eyes. We long for that day. We believe that it is not long hence. And very soon, all the signs are telling us that the coming of the Lord draweth near. Let us prepare to meet him.
We'll sing together, lead us, Heavenly Father, lead us. I want to invite all of us to join the sing. We can have the music play down, turn down a little low so that we can have this wonderful choir here use their voices in singing. <clears throat> oh, the worst tempestuous sea, guard us, guide us, guide us, keep us, feed us, for we have no help from thee. Yet Possessing every blessing, he for God our Father, the Savior breathe, Savior breathe forgiveness for us, all our weakness thou dost know. Thou didst spread this earth before us. Thou didst feel its keenest woe. Lone and dreary, faint and weary, through the desert thou dost know. Spirit of our God. Spirit of our God, descending, fill our hearts with heavenly joy, love with every passion blending, pleasure that God provided, pardoned, guided. Nothing can our To God be the glory, great things he hath done. So loved he the world that he gave us his son, who yielded his life an atonement for sin, and opened the life gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Let the earth hear his voice to God. Be the glory. <clears throat> God be the glory, great things he hath done. So loved he the world that he gave us his son, who yielded his life and atonement for sin, and opened the life gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory. Great things he hath of God, the vilest offender who truly believes that moment from Jesus a pardon receives. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. the Son, and give Him the glory, great things He hath done. Great things He hath taught us, great things He hath done, and great our rejoicing through Jesus the Son. 
but purer and higher and greater will be. Oh, wonder our transport. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory. Great things he hath done. Reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the 12th and onward. 12 verse and onward. Now, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. Yea, and we have found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. Ye are yet in your sins. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive, but every man in his own order. Christ the firstfruits, afterward they that are Christ's at his coming. Our next hymn in our brochure we will make use of through all the changing scenes of life.
end can it be that I should gain an entrance in the safest blood? We'll sing this one unaccompanied. Hello? And can it be that I should gain an interest in the Savior? Come on, everybody, help us sing. Die free for me. Who caused this pain for me? Who him to death pursued? Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for He left his father's house. He left his father's throne above, so free, so in finite his grace, emptied himself of all but love, and bled for Adam's sapless race. Tis mercy all immense and free. It found out me, tis mercy all, immense and free, for oh my God, it found out me. Long my imprisoned, long my imprisoned spirit lay, fast bound in sin and nature's night. Thine I diffused a quickening ray. I woke the dungeon flamed with light. My chains fell off, my heart was free. I rose, went forth, and followed thee. My chains fell off, my heart was free. I rose, went forth, and followed thee. No condemnation now. No condemnation now I dread. Jesus and all in him is mine. A life in him I live in. And clothed in righteousness. In righteousness divine, bold I approach the eternal throne and claim the crown through Christ my own. Bold I approach the eternal throne and claim the crown through Christ my own. Praise the Lord. My final hymn. When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound and time shall be no more and the morning breaks eternal bright and fair. When the saved of earth shall gather over on the other shore and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there.
Let's have the committal, closing prayer. Um, just after I do the final committal, we're going to ask Pastor Belgrave uh, to say a special prayer for the family and friends and, of course, especially the Flanders family. So if you can just come a little closer after, he'll say that special prayer for you. Let us pray. Let's have it quiet, please. Dear Father, we pray, dear God, that you would mark this spot where will this puppy rest. And we pray that the next voice that he hears will be your voice on resurrection morning as you call him forth to life eternal. We pray, dear Father, that you be with his family, his wife, and close relatives in particular. And continue to keep them by your grace. And may their lives be lived also, so that when you come, they will hear from your lips, well done. Thank you for hearing and answering prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. <coughs> now, let's pray by Pastor Belgrave for the family and all the close friends. Our oh, gracious God, we recognize, God, that death is not easy. But, God, in you, there is still hope. In you, God, we find our strength and we find our being. So, Father, this evening, this afternoon, we lift the small family. We lift, oh God, all friends, extended family members, staff of the Flanders Pharmacy, God, we bring them before you. And we pray, God, as they are gathered around, they will encourage and they will strengthen one another. Father, we lift us the small and the granddaughters and the great grand before you in a special way. We know, God, she is a believing woman in you. She is a Christian, God. And God, I pray as she look to you even now, her strength, God, lies in you. And I pray, God, you will honor her commitment over the years. You will honor her faith, God. And, Father, that she will stand still in these times and see the salvation of her God. Father, let your Holy Spirit, let your angels encamp round about each and every one of us. And we thank you, God, for how this service has went today. And we pray, God, indeed, that your Holy Spirit and your angels will continue to be with this family and all of these friends, oh God as we support and encourage one another. In Jesus' name we pray of thanksgiving. Amen. All right, thank each and every one of you. That brings us to the end of this service of celebration for the life of Brother Small. And we pray indeed that God will continue to bless each and every one of you. In Jesus' name, amen. Surrender.